Uh, good evening and welcome to the June meeting of the Audit and Standards Committee. Councillors and officers are reminded to put their mobile phone or electronic device on silent if they have one near them. And those present in the room should face forward, speak directly into their microphones and not place papers or electronic devices between themselves and the microphone. Please, would remote participants mute microphones when not speaking, as this will reduce feedback and background noise and save bandwidth to prevent loss of connection. Members of the Council and any independent persons joining us remotely should leave cameras uh, on. Uh, officers, please leave cameras on only for the agenda item you are speaking to. After each item has been presented, members and independent persons present in the room will be invited to ask questions first. Those members and independent persons joining us remotely will then be invited to speak and they should indicate their wish to do so by using the raise your hand facility. Only those members of the Audit and Standards Committee present in the room will be making the decisions and the result will be confirmed verbally for the benefit of those watching the webcast. All right, so we start now on the, the agenda itself with the minutes, with two lots of minutes, the 11th of April and the 16th of May. Uh, can I sign them as a correct record of those meetings, please? Agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, apologies, we have two. Um, Councillor Drayson and Robert Smith, is that right? Robert Brown, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so we have those two apologies. Um, are there any additional agenda items? I believe there are none. No, that's fine. Are there any disclosure of interest by people in the room, please? There are none. Right, thank you very much. Um, can I just remind you gently for each agenda item you will need to ask the proposer and seconder and um, once this is received all members will then obviously vote on those <laughs> items. So we start off with the standard reports and the first one is the Code of Conduct Complaints Monitoring and Other Standards Matters. Um, so if I could, we can start with that and um, there will be a second and, and Lorna is presenting it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, twice a year, the committee receives an update report setting out the details of the Code of Conduct complaints received by the monitoring officer. This last report, um, we, we last reported in December 21. Um, members are reminded that the view of at least one of our independent persons is sought um, on, on, on each complaint. Over the last six months, there have been six new uh, Code of Conduct complaints. Um, one was made against a district councillor five related to parish councillors, and of the six complaints, um, there were four dismissed. Two were referred to external investigation, of which one was found to be in breach of the Code of Conduct, and the other was dismissed due to a lack of evidence. Um, and those complaints are summarised in Appendix 1. I would just like to make a correction to the report. Um, in paragraphs 2, 3 and 4, it should reference complaint um, C2111, not C2112. So if I can just ask, ask you to note that. Um, this report also considers other standards matters such as training that has taken place over the period. Um, most notably, um, since the last report, the Deputy Monitoring Officer and I um, held a training session on the Code of Conduct and Complaints Procedure with Bexhill on Sea Town Council. Um, if there are any questions on, on the complaints, uh, the Deputy Monitoring Officer and I will be happy to answer them, uh, but the committee is asked to consider the report and agree any recommendations as appropriate. Thank you very much, uh, Lorna Ford. Are there any questions, first of all, to Lorna about her report? Uh, I think uh, Councillor Langlands and then Councillor Cortell. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just a question with regards to the... £10,000 cost to Rother for this, for a parish councillor. Is this normal procedure? I'm very sorry to say that it is. Um, so that investigation was quite a complex one. Um, in fact, the, he, he, he was appointed to do two investigations. Um, I don't think it's typical that we spend that much. We were hoping it would be quite a lot less, but just due to the amount of of, of work that he had to put in, um, that's what it cost the council, and it is up to the um, principal authority, the, the, the district council, to actually um, bear that, that cost. Yeah. So the follow-up 
whatever has been decided needs to go forward. Uh, that doesn't come as a cost to you, does it? Do the parish council pick that one up and pursue that? Yeah, I, I think if there was any training or anything like that that would need to be put in place, it would be down to the local council to actually pay for. But unfortunately, the investigation itself is something that has to be paid for by, by us in this case. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cottell. Has the monitoring officer or the deputy monitoring officer ever felt under external pressure to be leaned on to achieve a particular outcome on any investigation? Well, I will answer from my, myself first. Um, absolutely not. That is not the case. No. I have you that. That's uh, Councillor Cottell. Ask the deputy monitoring officer as well. Yes, we're interesting to hear. Uh, yeah, just to confirm, yeah, absolutely not, not at all. Thank you. Are there anybody here who would like to contribute to debating the content of the report, please? There are none. So can we then move, um, basically what we're doing here is simply to resolve that the report be noted. Those in favour, please show. Those against? Any abstentions? Abstention. Thank you very much. Thank you for your report. The next item is uh, number six. The government response to the review of local government ethical standards. And again, it's Lorna and Lisa to report. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, the purpose of this report is to consider the government's response to the review of local government ethical standards and to consider if any further action is necessary. Um, this committee did consider and respond to the committee on, on standards in public lives review back in March 2018. Um, since then, um, the Committee um, on Standards in Public Life report was published back in January 2019, and it made a total of 26 recommendations. Um, the Government had a bit of a delay in responding to these recommendations for good reasons, like the pandemic and Brexit. Um, and we actually, um, it, they published their, their response to the recommendations in March 22. These um, recommendations are set out in Appendix 1 of the report, and there's also a commentary from, uh, of, from an, an officer point of view, and it also sets out any action that has already been taken in response to these recommendations. Um, it's not my intention to go through all of the recommendations. It is quite a lengthy report, um, but members are asked to consider the report and agree any additional actions uh, the committee thinks is necessary. Thank you very much. And um, yet uh, again, please, any questions... Uh, to Lorna or to Lisa um, on the report. Uh, Councillor Barnes. Page 11. Um, publicly accessible social media. Um, it's a very curious area, social media. Um, and I do wonder whether we ought to give it some attention in the Code of Conduct uh, specifically. I'm by no means clear what publicly accessible social media means because we have various groups now um, which are what I would call semi-public in the sense they have membership, uh, but they are not um, friends. They are groups actually interchanging views for a particular purpose, much of it political. Um, and uh, I think we, we do need to have a look at this area because I think otherwise councillors can easily fall into a pitfall um, which would be damaging to this, not just to them, but to this council as well. That said, I do not want to inhibit free speech at all. And again, one has to be very careful um, to distinguish between harm, which could do damage, 
and the harm you could do to free speech if you don't allow fairly robust debate. Would you like to comment? Um, I, I would agree with Councillor Barnes. This is a difficult area, and I think it's something that we'd all benefit from further training on, and I'll have a chat with the Deputy Monitoring Officer um, about how, how we can bring that forward. I think there has been some training in the past, um, but this is something I, th I think is, is, is difficult. It's difficult to get on the right side of it and very easy to fall onto the wrong side of, of, of this um, particular new. And, and I think you're right, the nature of um, some of the posts that I certainly see on, on Facebook and other platforms um, you know, is there to provoke. And um, actually, that's not terribly helpful, but that's the reality. So I do think it would be something that would benefit from a bit of training and, and a bit of a look at it. A little further than that, though, uh, Chairman, and that is, um, I think the Code of Conduct probably does need specific attention. I'm not urging a rush, uh, but I do think, uh, in fact, it doesn't make any reference at all at the moment, specifically to social media. It seems to me an increasing omission. Uh, can I just say to members of the committee, I'm quite anxious to maintain the distinction because I think it is a useful one between questions to the officers, which we do first, and then a more broad debate later. So just, just to remind members of the committee about that. And, and uh, Councillor you may want to actually put some ideas forward because it does suggest under this item that we can put forward items for consideration. I think in some ways you already have. You suggested a particular topic, I haven't have you? Yeah. Yes, I know. <laughs> Are there any further questions then? Yeah, that's the one. Right, so I'm speaking as a parish councillor, um, and I absolutely agree with you that uh, social media can completely mess up a council's approach to a subject. So um, in terms of your approach of not changing, I would, I would think I'd mirror um, what the previous person said, which was that you do need, I think, a stronger approach, and that would include my council. I'd ha happily put in a stronger approach to use of social media. It's not exactly a question, but I suppose I could say, will you please do it? That's the question. Um, I think, uh, Lisa Cooper, did you, you had a contribution? Um, I was just going to make a comment, Chair, that um, our current code doesn't include social media because obviously it's, it's, it's a very old code and when we adopted it, it's, it's the old code that's been adopted for some time and social media was not uh, even probably around at that time. The LGA model code does include social media, but we've already looked at that and didn't decide to go with that for the various reasons that are set out in this report. But that might be something that you want to look at, whether we actually change our code and adopt the LGA code, which includes provision for social media. But again, that's something that you might want to, to look at. Yes, please. Um, I'd endorse that approach from the Deputy Monitoring <coughs> Officer because a number of the issues that independent persons have looked at have included reference to social media and varying audiences, understanding or misunderstanding um, in a way that is obviously what social media is designed to do. But I think clarity in this area through some training and potentially uh, a look at the LGA model code would be really welcome. Um, so I'd absolutely endorse it from an independent person's point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Cotel. Uh, first of all, Chair, I'd like to say that I fully agree with the previous three speakers, Councillor Barnes, Councillor Robertson, and the lady over here. Rose. Sorry? Rose. Rose. Um, uh, yes, I think so. We need to move into the 21st century uh, in our code of conduct and um, include... Um, social media. Uh, the reason, the, the question I had was totally different from that. Um, recommendation nine uh, says uh, the local government transparency code should be updated to provide that the view of the independent person in relation to a decision on which they are consulted should be formally recorded in any decision notice or minutes. Um, 
I'd like to ask the independent persons present what their view on this is. Would uh, somebody in that position like to offer um, a response, please? Yes, Rose. Happy to have a go. I think that the track through the independent person's involvement at every stage so that they're able fully and freely and in reference to earlier conversation, I've never felt under any kind of compulsion to um, give a view one way or another. It's entirely kind of open. Um, so that what we're not doing is um, kind of changing or updating or post-dating any view that we might have. So I think at the moment I would agree with the um, officer comment is set out there that if we are over-involved at every stage, it's unhelpful. But I think we should be appropriately involved at the earliest stage and give an independent up view, and that's very much how it feels and is at the moment. Thank you very much. Are there, yes, uh, Keith. Um, so I'm an internal auditor for several councils, or many councils, and one thing we have to check is compliance or transparency code. And it will be very difficult, I think, to assess compliance on something quite so broad as this. You know, whether 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 persons um, had spoken in a certain way or not in a way, whether, whether it means, so I wouldn't support that. Uh, it would be too difficult, I think, from an audit point of view to judge compliance. It's probably the wrong tool, transparency code. Are there th further comments on this issue or on any other issue on this item, please? Councillor Cotel. A separate item, Chair. Um, I discovered that um, while we have the Nolan principles, um, they do, they are not part of our code of conduct as such. They just guide our code of conduct. Now, for example, in uh, the House of Commons, um, if um, a minister were to mislead the House, um, that would be a resignation matter. But um, in our code of conduct, we do not have um, a way of um, uh, complaining about dishonesty, for example. Um, is that perhaps something we might consider adding to our code of conduct um, rather than having to um, uh, go for something very peripheral to that? If I can yes, answer, yes. Chair, thank, thank you. I, I, I think dishonesty is part of our code of conduct and something which we do assess our complaints against. So I, I think that that is covered. I don't know if um, Lisa has anything to add to that. Um, Lisa? Um, I mean, I think Councillor Cortell is correct. You know, the Nolan principles are an appendix, you know, and you, you can't necessarily raise a complaint against one of the Nolan principles. Um, but the code reflects those principles. So a dishonest councillor um, would probably bring the council into disrepute, for example, depending on the nature of whatever that they have done. Um, so there are other, other parts of the code that would be engaged if dishonest behaviour was found to be happening. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments on this subject? Okay, it does look as if the committee feels that um, social media represent a new challenge that the council should take on board. There seems to be a difference of opinion about the transparency code, and I think we've had an answer which says that although the Nolan principles are not actually written explicitly in, they underlie the actual operation of the code. So, thank you very much. Right, the, the next item, thank you very much, Lorna, for your report, and Lisa, uh, on that as well. Thank you both very much indeed. Sorry, Chair. Yes. I, I think we probably need to capture that additional... Would, would you like a vote on that, then? All right, okay. So can we have a mover and a seconder in relation to social media, please? Uh, Councillor Cortell, I think you were first. Uh, I'm very happy to second that. Uh, we're happy to 
defer to Councillor Barnes in view of the fact that he raised the matter and I simply endorsed it. All right. Okay, so you withdraw Councillor Barnes. Uh, would you like to actually give us a wording? Yes, I, I just wanted to press it by yes. saying I was not <laughs> advocating the adoption of the LGA code. I think there were good reasons why we decided not to. But what I do think we need to do, and possibly we can take on board the LGA wording, but I think that this committee uh, should set up a working party uh, to consider a provision in our code of conduct to cover the social media aspects of communication. Right, that seems absolutely clear. Thank you, uh, Councillor Barnes. So a motion then to suggest that we set up um, a group to look at um, covering social media um, within our code of conduct. Um, that's the issue. Do I have a second of that motion, please? Councillor Cottell, thank you very much. Now let's put that to the vote. Those in favour of that position, please show. Those against, please. And abstentions. I think that was unanimous. Thank you very much. Do we, do we need motions on the other suggestions? Do you think or not? Um, is, is there anybody else who wishes to put forward a specific recommendation in relation to the Code of Conduct, please? Those subjects were mentioned, like the LGA Code, um, but people may have differing opinions on that. Does anyone who wish to put forward a specific motion, or should we just leave it at that single motion? It looks to me as if uh, the people are perfectly happy to have that as our motion on this subject. So, thank you very much. Then. Thank you. Yes. In terms of implementation, Yes. of the working party. Could I suggest that Lorna does it outside the meeting? Y yes, uh, would, would you be happy with that? To, that's fine. To put yeah. together a working yeah. party to look at that. Yeah, that's fine. I think that would be excellent. I think it's something well overdue, isn't it, to look at social media. It has been a problem for so many people. Thank you very much indeed. All right, so the next, the next item then is the Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman uh, Report. And uh, Mark Adams is going to introduce it, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd like to like to introduce the um, Complaints Monitoring Report for the Local, Go local Government on and Social Care Ombudsman. Um, we report twice a year. Um, we report in December and in June. Um, so this is an update from the Ombudsman complaints that have been received um, from the 18th of November 2021 to the 27th of May 2022. Um, the report contains five um, ombudsman reports, um, three of which relate to planning, one relates to um, environmental health and licensing, and one re relates to um, neighbourhood services um, in relation to car parking. Um, in, in relation to outcomes, one of those complaints was upheld, um, which related to the um, the way in which we handled a, a noise complaint, um, you know, and our actions there were to, to apologise to the customer, um, which is a, a standard approach that um, the Ombudsman do take. Um, the remainder of the complaints were not investigated for a variety of reasons, um, some of which it's not in the, the Ombudsman's interest um, to investigate, um, or some of the issues raised fall outside of our responsibility as a, as a district council. Um, that, that is the, 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 the main report for the, the Ombudsman side. Um, I know members have had an interest in non-Ombudsman -on complaints, so this is our formal complaints process that um, we generally deal with prior to a complaint going to the Ombudsman. Um, so for the same period, so the 18th of November 2021 to the 27th of May 2022, um, we received 67 complaints. Um, 28 of these were treated as non-complaints, so there were service issues. Um, this is where um, departments need to have an opportunity to try and resolve the issues. It's sometimes it's matters that they are unaware of, so they should put, put um, take steps to put things right if they can. Um, a further seven of those complaints were resolved at the initial stage, so we, we had a um, a direct um, conversation with the customer to try and put things right. Um, however, 18 of those did go to what we call a stage one, um, and 
this is for, you know, where it requires a, a response formally in writing. Um, four of these were upheld, um, eight were not upheld, um, so, and six were partially upheld. So that is where some fault was found um, in some elements of the complaint. Um, and for the same period, um, there have been no stage two complaints. Um, and, and at the time of writing the report, there were 13 matters that were under investigation. Um, and again, I've given a breakdown um, on the, the number of complaints that we've received and then the detail of the um, time in, in response. Um, so I'm happy to I say, answer any questions in relation to this um, report. Thank you very much for your report. Um, it, can we now deal with the questions first? And obviously members of the committee will be well aware we had to exercise a considerable amount of discretion so there can be no way in which in any individual complainant could be identified. So just bearing that in mind, our questions. Uh, Councillor Kirby Green. Thank you. Um, two questions. Uh, the first is, um, we don't ever get to see what the numbers are in comparison to the quarter before or the year before that. It would be quite helpful um, to know, because that seems quite a lot, but it would be quite helpful to have some context around that to know actually what, um, whether it is a lot. Um, I'm more, more than happy to provide that, that detail for the next report, um, just like I say, so you have context. Um, and in terms of, I suppose, the quantity, that, that is a low number um, to go to the Ombudsman. Um, you know, on, on average, you know, we, we seem to have you know, under 15 complaints that, that, you know, per year. And again, there is comparative figures that the Ombudsman do hold um, that you could look at our neighbouring authorities, but we've always had um, a low complaints um, threshold in terms of the Ombudsman. Actually, it was the non-Ombudsman ones I was referring to, sorry. Um, but then the other question I have is, now, one of these I, I am aware of, and I thought it was a stage two complaint, but maybe it was a stage one one, but it was upheld. But there wasn't any remedy. There was a, yeah, absolutely, hands up, we've made, a, we've made an error here, we apologise profusely. And the person involved had to go back to the council and anyway, and then it, it, it sort of got, but the initial response was, yes, we're awfully sorry, the council have messed up, apologies. Do we, is that sort of all we have to do? Do we not include a sort of, therefore we could, we suggest we could do this moving forward? Because it doesn't really, whilst they're pleased that it was upheld, it doesn't really help them just by having a letter saying, yes, we, we've messed up. Um, there, there are always learning, learning outcomes that we can take away from um, complaint action, especially if it is, you know, a complaint is upheld in, in the, you know, where we've been found fault. So, um, there are remedy actions that we do do undertake, um, and some of those sometimes we can't share with the, the customer what, what action they have taken. However, we can also look to build that in actually to say in our complaint response, this is what we've done to address address the issue. So, um, I'm happy to you know, include in the report and look at how we can, how, you know, our learning outcomes and what what we've you know, done about. The upheld complaint side and what, what we can do to you know, stop that happening again next time. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Uh, Councillor Langham. Thank you, Chair. Mark, do we do, we do um, telephone responses to things initially rather than a letter? You know, I just sometimes wonder whether that sort of communicating via the phone to people about, yes, this is an issue we've discovered and um, we will resolve it X, Y, and Z. It just makes people feel a bit more as though you care, a bit more comfortable about the fact that you've spoken to them rather than written them a letter. I always find they're slightly impersonal, really, but as you say, especially when there isn't a solution. <laughs> um, thank you. So, yes, we... we um our phone's first instance is to make that initial contact by telephone. Um, if it's something that, that isn't overly complex and you know, that there isn't many layers to a complaint, um, so we, we do, like I say, do try and take that proactive approach. Um, hence, you know, in, in the report there are uh, seven of those complaints that are resolved at that initial stage, and often they are the ones that have made that early engagement by the telephone. Um, it's, it's you know, sometimes it's really important to listen to customers, you know, have that empathy and actually say, well, 
while we're here, but this is what we're going to do you know, to address that, that issue. Um, and I think that's where you know, there, there, there can be that more proactive approach. And we, we do try and do that as, as standard um, in our complaints handling policy. Um, that should be that, that first point of call. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Cortell. Thank you. Um, I was just a little bit surprised um, that one of these complaints uh, was um, dismissed by the local government and social care ombudsman um, on the basis that they couldn't hold the council responsible for the damage um, to the, the neighbour's property to one which the council had signed off after inspection. Um, would you like to comment, Mark? Um, again, it, 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 it is a tricky position because, you know, in terms of building control, um, that work has been signed off, but then it, it could fall under the competency of, of the constructor that, that has taken on that work. So the liability sits with that person that has carried out that work rather than the liability on kind of our building control sign-off. So it, it could be a number of reasons that the issues had occurred, um, and that's something that, that we, we aren't liable for, um, should it be like poor, poor workmanship. Are you happy with that answer, Councillor? Do you want to follow it up? I'm just saying that clarifies the issue. I'm grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any further comments on this item from members of the committee? They're, they're being done. They're, then our motion is to note the report. So can I see those in favour of noting the report, please? Those against? Carried unanimously. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Mark, for that very, very thorough report, showing a fine line, I noticed, between giving as much detail as possible but making sure you didn't go over the boundary. I thought you did that very, very carefully. Thank you. All right. The, the, the next uh, one uh, is going to be a report of the external auditor, uh, Grant Thornton, and this is going to be done remotely. So, um, so here we go. Uh, so the external, sorry, it's the annual, adi, uh, sorry, annual audit report. Uh, Grant Thornton, external auditors is the one. Yes. And so, uh, so I can now hand over to you, please. Just waiting to hear your report. Thank you, Chair. So th this is the report on uh, the review of the value for money uh, responsibilities of the external audit. It completes our work of the audit for 2021. We gave the audit opinion on the financial statements in May. And this sets out the, the second, uh, the findings of our second responsibility to consider uh, value for money. This is a new report for the first time that responds to the new code of audit practice. We're required to assess the arrangements that the council has in place to ensure its financial sustainability, to ensure that it has a good, strong governance framework and that it has appropriate arrangements to ensure economy and efficiency and effectiveness and its arrangements. As auditors, we're, we're asked to give a balanced commentary, uh, recognising both the positive aspects of your arrangements and any areas that we think are weaknesses. If we think there are weaknesses, we are asked to rate those weaknesses. If we consider the weaknesses are so significant, then we badge them as such and we would make a key recommendation for their for their uh, to address those weaknesses. So there are three key three types of recommendations. There would be a, at the highest level, there would be a key recommendation, which would be something the authority would have to respond to publicly. There would be a. Sorry, the first one is a statutory recommendation. The second one is a key recommendation which would respond to a significant weakness if that was identified. 
And the third element is an improvement recommendation where we would make a recommendation to highlight areas that we think uh, you could improve your arrangements, but those weaknesses were, were not so severe to be badged as a significant weakness. On page, I think it's page three of the report, we set out a summary and we've just uh, rag rated that, as you can see. So we highlight whether we felt there was a potential risk in your arrangements across those three themes at the planning stage. And then the second column highlights our findings. So I'm pleased to say that we don't think there are any significant weaknesses in your arrangements across those three themes, but we've identified six or seven areas of improvements that could be made and management have accepted all of those. I'm happy then to pick up any questions that members may have on the detail. Um, thank you very much, Darren, for presenting that report. Um, let's start with questions to Darren, please. Uh, Councillor Cottell. Um, recommendation three um, about separating discretionary spend from uh, statutory um, requirements. Um, I notice that uh, the officers have um, delayed implementing this till 23-24 as they seem to consider it of limited value. Um, I wondered why you thought it was important and why the officers consider it of limited value. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Uh, so I, I will let officers speak to f for themselves on the response. Uh, we felt it it is useful for members to have that information before them for those areas of the of the council's activities where spend is still discretionary because it can only it, uh, aid the decision making where uh, services or savings need to be identified. I appreciate that after many years of having to make savings, it, that's not the only um, that's not the only aspect that needs to be considered. And clearly, you as an authority are thinking about transformational changes uh, to ensure that you can drive those greater levels of savings that uh, that you need to achieve. But we do think that if if it's very clear where services are being provided and those are discretionary services, then having that made clear to members as they make those decisions can only aid that process. Thank you very much, uh, Darren. Um, you would like to uh, contribute, Anthony. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, yeah, so to pick up on Councillor Cortell's point, it's, uh, I mean, we have, first thing to say is that we've, um, we have approved, to, uh, we've agreed rather to implement the recommendation for the 23-24 budget. Uh, I think my concern really is that there is always going to be a degree of uh, sort of arbitrary judgment, if you like, uh, over the split of the numbers. It's not quite as clear cut as it may first come across. So I think, uh, you know, sometimes the, I, would, I would argue that some of the, the way we've structured our um, services and and so forth in terms of management and the way we've uh, set the budgets up. It, there, will be, yeah, there will be areas of uncertainty, and it will be very difficult to say with 100% um, certainty that that is the correct split between statutory and discretionary. Um, so we're, we're always going to be faced with that problem, and I think that's the thing that I really want members to understand. But for, for, as I say, for 23-24, um, we're, we're happy to implement the recommendation to the best of our ability, but as I say, there will be some... Uh, some level of uh, arbitrary level of judgment behind it i want to sit behind it can i first just from the chair just emphasize the distinction i was trying to make earlier which is that i'm suggesting the questions should be of a factual or informative nature and that when those have been dealt with then we can go on to matters that are more discursive in their in their uh, makeup all right uh, but councillor Cortell. could i inquire tony um of where you think there's a grey area between the um, essential services, legal essential services, and the discretionary services. Example. 
Do you want to have a go? Yeah, I'll have a go. Sorry, uh, not off the top of my head, um, Councillor Cox. I apologise. I'm happy to, to um, write to members outside of the meeting after the meeting with uh, examples of where I think it will be difficult. Uh, we know it will be. I know it will be because uh, we tried to do it as, uh, as uh, we tried to, or we, we reviewed it as part of the 22-23 budget setting process. Happy to answer it after the meeting, but I don't have that level of detail to hand. Okay, thank you. Any further comments? Councillor Barnes. I apologise, Chairman, for not giving notice of this earlier. Um, but reading through page six, I, I was struck what seemed to me an element of misunderstanding on the part of the auditors. And I just wanted to be sure by asking a question uh, whether they understand that although we will save money, by the transfer of services uh, to Bexhill Town Council, we will also forfeit special expenses. So because it operates on both sides of the budget, the amount of savings actually involved is going to be relatively small, net. It looks large, gross, uh, but it, my guess is that it's probably at most a couple of hundred thousand net. And I just wondered if the auditors fully understood it. When I read that paragraph, it looked as if they thought we were going to get something of the order of a million plus. And uh, we're not. Uh, can I ask whether Mr. Uh, Wells would like to comment on that? Obviously, we're not going into the policy issues, but just oh, no, it's a just the financial question. implications. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I think what we've picked up there and reported is what we understand has been put into the Council's own financial plans for the savings to be realised from this, this issue. But my, my point is, Chairman, that if you look at the MTFP, Yeah, uh, the savings figure is in the MTFP as a gross figure. But if you actually look in the MTFP, it also shows special expenses coming to an end. So it's 800,000 plus one year. It becomes naught in the next year. And reading that paragraph, it, it seemed to me that that point didn't seem quite to come across correctly in the audit report. Uh, can it be looked at? Mr. Wells? Yes, I, I, I would need to go back and check with, the, with my colleague who did the detailed work for me. So I'm happy to do that, just to, to be absolutely certain. Thank you very much, Jess. Are there any further questions or comments on this particular report? Uh, yes. Uh, referring on your page 17, uh, you talk about improving economy efficiency and effectiveness and refer to the Council's use of KPIs um, and the fact that it now goes to the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Um, having read the minutes of the last meeting of that, very many of those KPIs weren't being met uh, and the Council has expressed their concern, but you don't mention that at all in your report. Was there any reason for that or didn't you pick up on that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Farmer. Uh, Mr. Wells. Thank you. So I, we've certainly reviewed the papers. Uh, I, I confess I'm not sure why we felt we didn't need to make uh, a comment on that. I think we've, it's probably looking at the analysis of those indicators. I think from memory, some of them were it was the frequency of being able to measure them, plus acknowledging that it was it was a continuous review process. So whilst the last time those performance indicators were reported, that as you mentioned, a number weren't being met, we were we were assured that 
there was challenge, there was discussion, and there was a regular reporting against the targets that uh, members could consider. So that was more of our focus rather than commenting individually on the level of those performance indicators that were doing what, where you were performing well or you weren't performing so well. Thank you very much. Uh, do you want to come back on that? Sam? Yes, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, under, I think I understand your answer. I, I'm not sure I agree with it because surely as an auditor, if you found in your research of what's going on, that clearly things weren't going as they should do. And that report from the Overviewing Scrutiny Committee seemed to say that. One would have thought your report would have contained some comment on that. I suppose I'm being critical yeah. and just pointing out that I felt that the auditors should have pointed out that. Yeah, you're, you're, you're pointing out just um, a gap, if you like, in the report, and you'd like to see that addressed. I, I see the point. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kirby Green. May I just make a comment? Because I think we're on comments now. Um, with relation to the, the comment about transferring services, um, and it is a flippant comment, but it's taken six to seven years for the car park in Bowlesh to be transferred to Bowlesh Parish Council, and it still hasn't been transferred. So I would like to think that we have the resources within the council to actually move some of these transfers on, because if everything's going to take that long, it could be some time before we realise any um, savings. I think that's, that's a good question. Um, we have put re renewed effort, though, into... It is an item in our financial stability programme, and we have, we, we've now resourced that piece of work, so we now have a project officer. I've been leading the discussions with Bexhill Town Council, and we're really hopeful that um, next month we'll have some resolution with regard to pub public conveniences um, and um, we'll be updating Cabinet at the next meeting. So and we're, hope we're hopeful that we're, we're dealing with it in a pragmatic way and being able to sort of take an in-principle um, decision and bring that forward to um, the next meeting of Cabinet. Um, but I do take your point, these things are complex and we have to, we have to find a way of dealing with it and, at a level in, in which we can get a decision without having to have all of the detail for, for, for that point, but we've had very positive discussions with Bex Hill Town Council, that's sort of phase one of the devolution programme, and we're starting the engagement with other local councils too. But, you know, this, this has been an ongoing project, really, I think since about 2011. So, but now it's time to really give it some oomph, and that's what, what we're trying to do. Any further comments on this item? Councillor Cortell. I'd just like to... Uh, point out recommendation two that up until now there hasn't been a workforce strategy i.e. to make sure there are sufficient staff in place to deliver services going forward and that one of the recommendations which has been accepted by officers is to have a workforce strategy which I think should help in cases like this in the future. Thank you very much Councillor. Uh, any further comments on this item, please? It looks as if members of the committee feel that um, it is a thorough report. Uh, one or two gaps have been pointed out. Um, obviously, there's a desire, um, I can hear, to try to get on with the actual devolution matters, um, but also a uh, suggestion of good progress um, being looked forward to in connection with that. Um, so basically, what our job here is simply to note the report. So those in favour of noting the report, please show. Those against and any abstentions, so that is also unanimous. Thank you very much and thank you for your report. Darren, I think you're doing the next report as well, aren't you? Which is the external audit report, um, the ex external audit plan for the year ending March 2022. So it's over to you again. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So this is the uh, audit plan for the 21-22 financial year. Its, its purpose is to set out the findings of our risk assessment for the year, and we therefore highlight those areas that we will spend more of the audit time uh, in the audit of the financial statements, and we describe those as significant risks. Typically, they tend to be 
those areas of the financial statement that are more subjective or potentially complex or have a greater risk of material uh, misstatement. So an example of that is the valuation of council properties and property plants and equipment. We also set out our determination of materiality, which guides the, uh, the audit in that we can't test every single item because the cost would be prohibitive. So we, we have to use materiality to sample both income expenditure and assets and liabilities. There's a program of work that sits behind these um, higher rated audit risks that ensures that all of the material transactions, disclosures, balances within the financial statements are subject to uh, a degree of testing. We also set out the what we intend to do this year for the value for money work. There aren't any um, significant risks, but what we have highlighted is just the, the, the format, the framework for value for money, building on what you've just heard for the last presentation and some of the points that uh, members have just made in response to our report for last year we will certainly pick up and, and reflect more substantively in this year's uh, value for money work. We also record our independence, which is important. And I think, and the audit fee, I guess, which is also very important for members. Uh, with that, I'm, I'm happy to uh, take any questions that members may have. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Any questions uh, to Darren, please? And none. Any discussion on his report, please? Councillor Cortell. I'd just like to make a personal statement, Chair, that um, due to prostate cancer, I have not been able to do as much work as I wanted on today's agenda. And from this point on, I haven't been able to um, read the rest of the agenda. Um, that is unusual for me, uh, but I'm running on two cylinders at the moment, having to take several hours a day off work. So um, I'm just um, putting it in the public domain that um, I will be keeping quiet and abstaining for the rest of the agenda. And I just say from the chair that I'm sure that <clears throat> all members of the committee are very well aware of your conscientiousness and the thoroughness with which you do your work as a councillor. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure that we all wish you the very best of the treatment that you're having. And we all very sincerely hope that you'll have a successful outcome. And we're very grateful to you Thank for you coming. Thank you very much. Very grateful to you for coming. Thank you very much. Right, there, there are no, no comments on this, so um, I, we, we have to put this to the vote then. So again, it's resolved, the report being noted. Those in favour, please. Those against. And any abstentions? So, again, it's unanimous. And I'd like to say, uh, to, to thank uh, Mr. Wells for the extremely thorough and, uh, audit reports produced by his company, which have been very, very helpful, I think. So, very grateful for that. So, now we come on to item number 10, the internal audit. This time, it's Gary Angel introducing the internal audit, the annual report, and the opinion on 2021 to 22. Gary, please. Chair, um, each year I'm required to deliver an internal audit opinion on the overall adequacy and effectiveness of the Council framework of governance, risk management and control. This opinion is expressed in this report and, and is based on the audit work completed in 2011-22, results of which also feed into the annual government statement, which I believe you'll be getting at the next meeting. Um, other items covered in this report include a summary of the performance of the internal audit service in 2021-22, a statement of how well we conform with the public sector internal audit standards, which are the professional standards that, that, we, that guide our profession, um, and an update on the whistleblowing activity, plus, of course, my usual quarterly report in there as well, all in the mix. Um, just to outline a few key points, points in the report. Firstly, the summary of audit, audit activity in the quarter four. Um, we issued eight reports in the final quarter of 2021-22, 
the executive summaries of which are produced in Appendix A, which is on page 82 onwards. Um, the audits issued were VAT, creditors, tax, stroke tax, IP, computer system, council tax, business rates, benefits, main accounting and debtors. There was quite a lot of reports in the last quarter because we, yeah, there was some were not quite finished the previous quarter and it was a catch up at the, to get as many done by the year end. Um, five of these reports provided good assurance on the overall governance arrangements, meaning no areas of significant concern were found. Three of the audits, that would be creditors, the BACS, BACS, TEL, IP, computer system and debtors received limited assurance rating because of improvements in controls were required. The reasoning behind these limited assurance ratings are outlined in paragraph 7 and explained in more detail in the executive summaries in the appendix A. Um, overall performance in 2021-22, full details of the audits completed in, in that year, last year are shown in appendix B, which is on, is on the table on page 96. This shows that 91.3% of the planned audit work was completed by year end. Uh, we worked to the target of 90% each year and we've achieved, I'm pleased to see we've achieved that, but it is always a bit of a moving target because obviously I think it's a guess, best guesstimate what we're going to do during the year and we have to um, be flexible if anything comes up that needs our attention. So to achieve the 9% is, is good in my, in my opinion. Um, implementation of audit recommendations. The progress of the outstanding audit recommendations has been followed up as I usually do every quarter and it's shown in the tables in Appendix C, which is on page 97. The table at the top shows that we've still got three old year recommendations outstanding. Um, that's unchanged from the previous quarter. Whereas the table at the bottom shows good progress continues to be made on the last year's audit recommendations with almost two thirds now completed. Counter fraud work and other financial savings. I'm very pleased to announce we, we, uh, we, as well as doing assurance work, we, we managed to find some savings for the council. Um, we always dedicate uh, one of our team uh, time each year to look at counterfraud work, which is usually council tax and business related savings, but also we look at SIL. Um, this <coughs> last year we saved 30, over £30,000 in counterfraud savings, but there's also uh, the next one, 41000 we've saved as a byproduct of our audit work, where we've found something that should have been billed and wasn't, or, or some savings that could have been made somewhere. And we only count these savings when they're in the bag, once they've been realised. So we don't, we don't, we're not um, speculating or um, looking across a longer period. Um, results of the quality, the quality assurance initiatives, um, details in the, in the report, how I, we measure the proficiency, effectiveness and quality of the internal service. Um, as you know from the last committee, I think it was, I, I do an annual audit assessment of, for those that were here last time, of... Um, of how we're performing against the standards. Um, we've also had the external quality assessment a little while back now, in, in June 2017, but both demonstrate a high level compliance with the standards. Um, as I just hinted at, we, we're due another external quality assessment now, and um, I'm hoping now, I've been talking to colleagues at Hastings, Lewis, and Eastbourne and Wildon, and we're hoping to get a reciprocal arrangement going uh, so we can all. Um, Ceci Javert, so that will be a best way forward, I think. Um, we also capture client feedback during the year through questionnaires that are issued both to the operational manager and also to the heads of service or, or higher managers. Um, the results are, for the year have been good, and they're summarised in the table in, in paragraph 24, with a high level of satisfaction in the quality of the internal audit service. Performance measures on the bottom of page 78 show internal audit performance against the targets. We've met all the, metal exceeded all the targets that set for the number of governance audits completed during the year because we didn't achieve 100% because two were still outstanding on the 31st of March, but they've both since been issued um, and they'll be reported at the next committee. Conformance with pub public sector internal audit standards. This is the state number required to make every year. Um, and I, I've said that we generally conform with the requirements of the standards based on, you know, the work we've done to, to prove that. Um, overall assessment of the Council's internal, audit, internal control systems, this is in paragraphs 30 to 32. The main takeaway here is that whilst internal 
audit work did highlight some significant concerns with internal control environment in 21-22. The issues raised have since been addressed. Then it comes to the important bit of this report, the opinion on the control environment, which is in paragraph 33. Um, this sets out the basis for providing assurance on how well things have operated in the areas audited during the year. Um, if we look once more at Appendix B, we can see that whilst three audits received a limited assurance rating in 21-22, so a negative assurance rating, almost all of the control objectives reviewed during the year were met at least in part. So elements of, certain, of a few audits were, were not going well, but overall everything was looking good. Um, this leads to my conclusion shown in paragraph 37. Uh, the key point to note here is that despite the number of issues found during the year, I'm still of the opinion that the Council's framework of governance, risk management and control is adequate and effective. Finally then, uh, the last bit of the report is about whistleblowing activity in 21-22. This is just a, a summary of, of, of stuff that's come, come to me during the year and, and, and we've, I've tried to um, investigate where possible and, and move on to people to follow up where necessary. Um, obviously, I can't go into any detail on the cases here, but um, it's, it's not, I think it's down slightly in numbers from last year, but I don't know if you can take much from that because it depends what's gone on during the year. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions on the report. Thank you very much for that report, uh, Mr. Angel. Um, so, uh, questions first of all, please. Factual and informative questions, please. Councillor Kirby Green. Thank you. Um, two questions. Um, the first one is with the whistleblowing. Um, it's interesting to know how many, so it's 26. Are we able to know how many actually ended up with some action? I mean, some of those presumably are uh, maybe, um, what's the word, you know, malicious people. Do we know how many actually were found to be, have some basis? I'm afraid the short answer is no, um, because I, can, I could only tell you with any confidence any ones I've investigated fully myself, because they're passed on to other people. I don't think a great many of them end up with anything, and, some, and, it, and if it's benefits or something involved, that gets passed into someone else, and it's, they're very much in the hands of the DWP or they involved, if they take an action there. So. And then, Second question? Yeah, the other one is, I suppose it's a comment as well as a question. Um, the council tax audit says, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic continues to be felt on the collection and recovery. Most visiting officer inspections are still suspended at present, apart from urgent inspections and those that can be carried out without the need to enter the property. I mean, when are we, what has got to happen for us to start doing proper inspections? I, I'm really troubled, really, because life's moved on. We're all sitting here in this meeting, and I'm just concerned that certain, not particularly, rather, but certain organisations are using COVID as an excuse still not to do their job properly. And I'm just concerned that why those visiting inspections aren't happening. I'm not sure that's the case, but I mean, I can't really answer for the Revenue Benefits Manager. But I do, I can confirm that they've got a new... Um, system in place with tablets that, that would help the visiting officers um, input their findings when they're out and about, so it will get fed on the system. And I think they're implementing new procedures, so I'm really hoping that it will improve in, an, in the near future, and, and it will be a much position when we report, better position when we report next time. So. Can, can I just say that in, in some ways, one of the things that I think would... I mean, the, the committee today has obviously been working in a very, very focused way, but just, just something that has... Uh, we've also been reminded of, and that's the importance of actually giving notice of questions in advance. Because I think it's so much better for us if officers can actually know what the questions are in advance, have answers. It's much better than being told we can give you the answer. Um, any further comments? Uh, Councillor Bond. So this question came out of something that Gary actually said, and I hope I caught it correctly. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen a, a red N before since being a member of the committee. And I was also rather worried when I read the creditors' audit with limited assurance. I think Gary said, but I just want to check that I heard him correctly, uh, that both those things have now been put right. In other words, there is now proper control over the submission of data to BACS and the position on creditors has been gripped satisfactorily. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, I'm afraid I must refer to Tony Bajan on, on, the, on the creditors' front. 
when I was said the, the issues have been addressed at the trade, I meant the high risk recommendations. There were no high risk recommendations in the creditors audit. It got the negative rating because there was a lot of issues. So it wasn't for the no significant killer problems there. It was just the quantity of problems we found. Um, I mean, two of them were recommendations that have been hanging around for quite a while, and they, and they have. It's been decided they will not proceed to resolve them now because it would cost too much money for the for the risk involved. So it's fair enough. A management decision has been made. Been made there. Bet assurances that the, the other issues that are raised in the audit are being addressed, but of course I haven't followed it up for this for this audit that they don't get followed up till six months after they're issued. So hey, um, I'm hopeful, but I can't keep your hand on heart. I'm, I'm sorry, I've, I misheard you in that case. Yeah, no, I, I, might, I, I might have, may have not report. phrased it correctly, but there. Yeah, I was talking about the high risk recommendations. Yeah. Tony, do you want to add something to that? Uh, yeah, well, not maybe <coughs> one, but you know, <laughs> I'm not obliged I'm, to. I'm maybe. Delighted. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, well, I'll start with the, the troublesome one first of all, the Red N. Um, that was uh, an issue, uh, that was a resource issue, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, finding the right responsible officer to, to take charge of the, the BACS process, which uh, Gary, I'm sure, will follow up in his audit, but I'm sure we've resolved that now. I will double check, but uh, I'm pretty sure we've resolved that. We have a, a responsible uh, officer within my um, systems team. Uh, with regards to the creditors, uh, which I think were less serious issues, now the, I, I can't remember the exact detail, but there were, I think there were issues around the, um, uh, the uh, some uh, purchase orders that were placed. Um, there was a glitch in the system which allowed them, allowed one or two, I think one or two uh, transactions from the internal audit sample to be approved and, sorry, raised and approved by the same officer, which is, uh, which is clearly not right. Uh, but they, the number of um, instances that, that occurred, I think there were only maybe two or three instances out of, you know, we're, we're processing thousands of transactions um, every month and hundreds every week. Uh, it would have cost us a lot of money to have had that resolved from, uh, by our um, software supplier. Uh, and we made a, a judgment that uh, due to the uh, infrequency of these uh, occurrences that it wasn't worth Worth uh, financially worth right. assuming, so we, we had to make that judgment call. It would have cost us a lot of money to, uh, uh, to have rectified it on the system. And if, hopefully, if I, unless yeah. I've misquoted the game, hopefully that's. Uh, I'll that's just add to that. Um, um, I'll just add to that that um, it's, it's the, the operational manager's discretion if they if they want to accept the risk or not. No. I, I, I mean, I report I reported to this committee to tell us to tell them that, that they won't be proceeding on those recommendations. The only time I would. Um, raise it as an issue at this to this committee as if I felt it was unreasonable to accept the risk. And, I, and that's not the case in this case. That's fine. Uh, are you happy then with those answers? Yes. Right. Perfect. Um, and some more, I think, Councillor Cortell first, and then Mr. Farmer. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, following on from what Councillor Kirby Green was saying about whistleblowing, um, might it not be useful in future to have a system to be able to have the quantitative results on whistleblowing. For example, out of the 26 whistleblowing cases, how many resulted in useful action being taken and how many were dismissed. Um, my second question is, has, have there been any victims from whistleblowing with regards to anybody being penalised as a result of whistleblowing? Well, um, if I handle the second part first, I can assure you absolutely not. No one has been penalised for whistleblowing. I mean, there's been, there's been no whistleblowing things that would have, of that nature, been no, there have been no staff on this, for example. So I have to always have to be very careful of the staff whistleblowing one. And they're, they're rare, but they, they do occur sometimes uh, to protect their anonymity as far as you can. Um, I say as far as you can, because if they're working a team of two or one, it's, it's pretty obvious who it is, but you, know, you, but you don't shout about who they are. Um, but yeah, so, that so on that point, absolutely no, no problem there. But as for the results of the whistleblowing, I mean, I'd, I'd like to be able to report back the results of them, but I, I don't honestly think I'll be able to do it, because it's, um, I don't, often, I mean, if the, like if it's passed on to DJ or the P to investigate, I hear no more. Um, and it's, and Quite honestly, that means they don't do any taking action on it because they've got their own financial constraints and they, they work to sort of like criteria of 
only, only um, potential fraud over a certain amount of money and things like that. Um, I mean, if there's a planning type one, I will report it to the planning enforcement. They, I sometimes get feedback from there what they've done, but they, even they won't. If you don't, they only work to official complaint if, if it's a named person. And if I've got a name to give them, and bearing in mind most of whistleblowing come in anonymously, they, you know, there's not much going to happen there. But I do always point out what they've said just in case, and you often find it's, they know something about the case because it's, it's not the first time. Because whistleblowing is often used, often used for the last um, effort to try and get something. They've tried going from other methods, and, and I often get what I call scattergun approach emails. You know, I'm included in sometimes with councillors as well and, 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 and anyone that they think is important. Um, and, and consequently, some of the ones I get aren't really... And if it can do anything about it, to be honest. But, and, there are, and of course, you get people that send me things which just aren't relevant at all, so they're not really whistleblowing. So I have one very recently, it wouldn't be in these figures, but it, uh, it was, they, weren't, they just weren't happy with the planning decision, basically. So it's not a whistleblowing case. I log it as I've dealt with it, but it's not, not a whistleblowing at all. So I'm um, sadly, I, I think it would be difficult to get a meaningful figures. Um, can I just say from the chair that I, I think that your, your presence here is more about a kind of quantitative reporting, isn't it, on cases rather than the qualitative um, answers that I think you were seeking, Councillor Hotel. There may be other ways in which you can kind of get answers to the important questions you're asking. Yeah? Yeah, well, yes, they are important, but I, I'm not quite sure whether it's um, Gary Angel's function at this committee to, a, to answer those kind of questions. Yeah? Thank um, you, Chair. But, um, but, um, yeah, it's, I mean, I, I'm here really to assure you that there is a mechanism for reporting whistleblowing, and they are looked at confidentially by me. I'm the only person that sees them. Lorna will confirm that I don't even share the name of her when I'm talking about someone. I talk about it in general terms of if I just want to see what she thinks about sort of thing. Um, and I try and do it with the best integrity that I can, and I, and I try to think of the best method to move things on. But sometimes people ask the impossible and talk to me, so we can't, can't always do things for them. Probably a definition of an officer's life actually being asked to do the impossible. <laughs> yes. Um, any further questions? Yes, uh, Mr. Hunt. Gary, can I bring you back to the creditors' audit? Yeah, sure. um, two things, really. Um, from my past experience, I've found that you can get into a lot of problems if purchase orders aren't followed and voices are paid without purchase orders. I've had experience of that really causing major financial difficulties. Um, your comment, officers were reminded the rules for ordering goods and services following the last audit, and this has had little impact. Further action is required to enforce the use of purchase orders. Um, I think my main question on this is, in your executive summary, you say you've made recommendations, but we don't see what those recommendations are, and we don't see what management response is. If we had that in your report maybe a lot of these questions would be answered. Yeah. It would be useful, I think, for your reports where there are actions uh, or recommendations that we have that information on this committee. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. I think, I think that there's a balance to be struck between um, putting, being too verbose and putting too much information so you can't. So I'm trying to, as it suggests, is a summary of, of what we find. But I think, yeah, if there's, if there's a, a, an action that's been taken or we've agreed to be taken in there, Sometimes it might be useful to put it in there for give you a bit of balance there of, of what can be done. That would be very helpful. Um, I have a second question, Chair, which is, is because we've got Gary, it is not related to his report now. At a previous meeting, we raised the issue of his responsibility for risk management. And an action was put out that senior management should look at that because this committee was very concerned about his role and what the real responsibility uh, if you wish, I can read the minute that we, uh, we put out at the time. Members had considerable concerns about the audit manager's role in the risk management process and questioned who would ultimately be responsible for managing stroke mitigating council-wide risk going forward. Members recommended that it would seem necessary for a senior officer to be identified to take the responsibility for managing risk. Members requested and agreed these concerns be taken back to senior officers. We've never had a report back on that to this committee. I think I'd like to refer to um, Lorna for, for a reply on this, please. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, we have been doing a lot of work on our risk management framework and our risk register. And one thing um, and one change that we really want to make, you're absolutely right that Gary, in, he enables the process, he, he facilitates the process. But when it comes to the ownership of those risks, they will indeed sit with a member of management team. And I think that's absolutely right and proper. We haven't got an update on risk management on, the, on this agenda, but we will be bringing one forward. We're also doing a workshop um, in a couple of weeks, um, and that involves our senior management team and uh, members looking at risk appetite and having a risk ap appetite statement. So we've been doing a lot of work around risk, and it's very much acknowledged, actually, that, that Gary has enabled, he's been brilliant in, in, in helping us sort this out and actually facilitating that process, but absolutely, those risks are owned by management team. Can I ask whether you're satisfied with that? So there's an answer on the actual, the chain, as it were, of responsibility within the authority. Did that answer your question? I think it answers it on the basis that can we expect when the next risk report's done that issue is clarified in that report? We can certainly do that, and it will have a named person next to each risk, um, and they will be responsible for updating those risks. So, um, yeah, that's absolutely right. Yes, no, I'm satisfied. Thank you very much. Are there any further points on this report? <coughs> yes, Councillor Lang, then. Just to follow up on that, then, um, Lorna, if it, looking at uh, point 15 on page 77 about the sill and the fraud, and there's been an officer um, obviously appointed to deal with that, um, but no income has been raised, although there are several, um, they've identified several issues regarding fraud in the sill. Um, how, does that go back to planning then to pick up on that? Because obviously um, no collection has been made and nothing's been done, although, although Gary's identified it. I'll say that on Yeah, can you? Gary, yeah, Gary. Yeah. Um, I, don't know, I don't know where we'll be on the report, but yeah, um, but yes, the still stuff is referred. Yeah, still stuff is referred back to, to planning to take action. Um, one of my team has been liaising with, who does most of the finding of the, of the stuff, has been liaising with them, and we hope to get some movement on it soon. Uh, unfortunately, we've been faulted every time we've, we've come up with stuff because first it was COVID, and then they had a change of officer, still officer, and yeah. but they've, this, it's been I think it's been post a few months now. The current still officer and. and if you, we're, we're liaising with them to try and get things moved. I mean, we could, we could potentially find savings of hundreds of thousands of pounds if, if, if they go through. Don't get too excited because it's, <laughs> it, it's capital, not revenue. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, okay. uh, but it's, um, still, it, yeah. it must uh, help us out on the yeah. borrowing or whatever. But, so, um, but, but as I said earlier, we don't, ca we don't count any of these savings to them in the bag. So when they've, when they've managed to get hold of someone and got them to pay for not declaring their... They're, 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 they weren't as, it wasn't as, as uh, how, how I left, led us to believe, you know, and they, they should have paid, from one, got, they got an exemption they weren't entitled to, for example, or they've subsequently let it out um, within the period they're supposed to retain the property and things, and the property, property in front, we would certainly try and get them to pay the council some money. The trouble is that the time is of the efforts of all of the essence of all debts, you know, if you leave stuff too long, the people have moved on, you can't get hold of them. So some of the earlier ones we notified might not come to anything, but we've got quite a few that have gone to them. So hopefully, hopefully by next time, next year, I'll be able to pull in some savings on still. Oh, I have some good news at one of these committee meetings. I'm happy with the answer then. Yes. yes. Any further points, please? Yes, uh, Councillor Barnes. Follow that up then. Does that mean then that payments to those parishes who are dependent on getting their sill have not been getting it in time? The sill repayments, that is. I guess by default, yeah, if we're not collecting the money, they're not getting their share, yeah. Well, that has been a bit of an issue, certainly as far as Tysus is concerned, because that's been mentioned at several parish council meetings. And I just hope that possibly this might give a bit of a a scoot on to, the, to that payment if it's still outstanding. I think it's, a story. It's, not, it's not a case of um, they're not billing people. They should be billing people because as soon as the work commences, they're supposed to bill them. But if people don't tell us their work has commenced, we don't know to bill. And, and we've, we're finding cases also, you know, of people who have, have not got exemptions they're not entitled to. We take it on good faith and they tell us it's only because we're, we're looking on the internet and things and find that they're renting a house, B&B &B in a place like that. <laughs> 
you know, it's it, we find with a lot of it's all this is all desktop work. What, what we're doing? Yes. That uh, is causing concern, and that is we've discovered lately that Optivo has been selling on properties that for which they have no further use, and presumably those should be in those, those should have to have seal paid because they wouldn't have paid seal at the time if they were of that age. You know, I mean, I, I gather the old properties came before SIL. But I think this is one to watch because we have heard that Optivo is selling off properties um, when they require work being spent on them. And that is sure that they are surely entitled to have to pay, pay SIL. I may be wrong, but I think it only applies to new builds. Um, but, you know, I'm prepared to be corrected on that. So if you've had a property for years and... Does anyone know for certain? Um, yeah, well, surely it depends on when the house was built. So if, if, if at the time the house was built, still so was applicable, but it was built as an affordable home, yeah. then that excludes it. So it depends when these houses were built. So yeah, new builds. But what I think what Councillor Barnes is saying is because they were affordable housing, they weren't liable for sill. But they're right. now selling them off on the open market by auction. So they are being sold off on the open market, which means that they should really be still applicable if they were excluded in the first place when they were built as social housing. Does that make sense? Now. Now, um, yeah, I mean, ever since Council introduced you, I can't remember how many years ago it was now, five or six years ago, whatever, it's probably more than that. Um, yeah, if it was built within that time, yes, it should, still, still probably apply in that case. Any, any further questions, then, please, or, or comments? Just, just quickly following that up, yeah. and that is how, how, do one, how do we keep tabs on those properties which are being sold which should have had still paid? Um, I think the housing have a, a list of, of affordable housing for nomination rights and things like that. So, but how closely that's monitored, I don't, I don't know, because we're talking about a lot of houses, obviously not enough. But <laughs> I mean, I would guess that there are legal issues here about at what point a house is actually um, put in the category of being an affordable house and whether it can change category when it's sold. I don't know whether anybody here knows the answer to that. Whether once it's categorised in a certain way, it stays in that category, or whether it can migrate category if, it, if, it's, if the purpose and if the way it's used changes. Logically, yes. Uh, Councillor Green. No, I was only going to say yes. Once it goes on the open market, it changes category, is my understanding. Verify. Right, any, any further comments? If not, there are two, two particular resolutions on this. They are different, so I'll treat them as two different ones. The first one is the Internal <coughs> Audit Activity and Performance in 2021, 22 be noted. So that's number one. Those in favour of that, please. Those against. And then the abstentions. So again, unanimous. Now the second one is different. It says that the audit manager's opinion on the control environment, paragraph 37, be approved. So it's a specific motion about the audit manager's opinion on the control environment. Paragraph 37 be approved. You may want to just look at that quickly so you know what you're voting on. Yeah, okay. Uh, can I have a proposer? Um, for that motion, please. Councillor Barnes, and a seconder for it, please. Councillor Langland. Okay, so that is the motion. The audit manager's opinion on the control environment, paragraph 37, be approved. Are we ready to vote on that now? Yeah. Okay. Those in favour of that motion, please show. And those against, and those abstaining. So that is also proposed, as I passed. Okay, so now we come to item number 11, the 2021-22 Statement of Accounts, the Audit Planning Risk Assessment. Um, so now Tony Baden is going to be reporting on this. Tony. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, yeah, so members are asked to uh, confirm their understanding of the management responses in this report, and they're, they're um, laid out in Appendix A. Uh, first of all, uh, and I apologise, there's an error on the, on the report. Paragraph A is irrelevant. Um, the, um, the 
eagle-eyed amongst you will, uh, will probably uh, realise that I was trying to write the Treasury Management Report at the same time and included an erroneous uh, conclusion in it. So uh, apologies for that. Um, I'm afraid it's a, it's a long report, um, and taking out paragraph 8 doesn't make it much shorter. Uh, but it is a vital report, and it's, uh, I think it's important that we're, um, you know, we're open with members about what our responses to the auditors are, and that's the, that's the whole point of the report, really. Um, so the, the, two, the, the, appendix, the appendix A is the, is the crucial thing. You have the, uh, the management responses to the audit questions, and then you have a, a supplementary document after that, which is uh, uh, entitled Accounting Estimates, and that's our response to the auditors about uh, certain detailed questions around, around the audit itself. So why, uh, why are we bringing this report now? Well, Grant Thornton are required by uh, auditing standards to scrutinise more closely areas of risk uh, to the Council's uh, statement of accounts. So that's, that's why it's here. Uh, and that appendix is a, is a, a replication of the uh, questionnaire that we, or questionnaires that we were sent by Grant Thornton and, and we have subsequently responded to. So in order to uh, scrutinise uh, closely or more closely the areas of risk and fulfil their obligations under accounting uh, and auditing standards, um, they, obtain an, or they need to obtain an understanding of uh, council's management processes, and they've done that via those two, uh, two questionnaires attached. Um, the remaining part of the process then is for, for Grant Thorne to, re to receive an assurance from uh, the, the phrases those charged with governance, uh, or to put it another way, uh, Audit and Standards Committee, uh, and they're required to uh, get that assurance from yourselves um, that you understand the council's management response to the certain risk areas covered by those questionnaires. Um, as I say, it contains the entire list of questions and answers. I'm, I'm not going to run through them one by one because we'll be here for a very long time if I do. Uh, and my ex expectation is uh, that members have read the papers in advance of the, of the meeting and understand the responses. I'm more than happy to uh, take any questions and try and answer them if I can. Uh, and once um, we've had the discussion, hopefully if members approve the paper, um, we can confirm the understanding to Grant Thornton um, that, they, that they understand management's uh, res um, uh, responses uh, in, in relation to the 21-22 accounts. And the, that will then enable them to carry on or, or begin, uh, officially begin if you like, complete rather the 21-22 audit. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tony. Questions to Tony first, please. Mr. Palmer. As you say, Tony, there are an awful lot of uh, detail in this, and I think a lot of it is of a nature that we wouldn't understand the detail anyway. So my question to you is, are there any of the management responses that you believe will cause the auditors to have any concern? No. And I can say that, we, well, I will say that with a degree of certainty because uh, this, this isn't actually the first year we've, we've completed the questionnaire. Um, what we did last year, and Councillor Barnes, I think I might be right in saying this, you may recall, uh, Councillor Barnes, that... Uh, we, we went through the questionnaires and you approved it. Um, uh, we, we had the delegated authority to approve it in uh, Councillor Giovanni's absence, as it was. So uh, it's not actually a new document and the questions aren't new uh, and there's nothing that's uh, changed um, that gives me any cause for concern that makes me think that the audit is going to uh, throw up any, uh, any problem areas for the council. Um, I think in Darren's... Uh, Darren Wells' uh, report about the audit plan, there were several areas of risk uh, that he covered in there, that he highlighted in there, that he's, but they, they weren't a specific comment on um, anything that he's seen in the council. That's, uh, they, those were standard areas, I believe, that the, accounting, uh, the auditing standards require him to cover. Um, so, no, there's nothing in the, uh, in the document that um, gives me any cause to believe that there will be a problem with the audit this year. Very much. Okay. Uh, do you want to come back on that? No, I think that's because it's very difficult for us to question these responses. I think we need Tony's assurance that he's satisfied that there won't be a problem. He's just given us that. He gave a nice crisp note, didn't he, right at the beginning? Exactly. Which was very reassuring, that would be limited, wasn't it? So we, we understand. Yeah. Okay. If, if I may, I, I think there, I mean, based on what um, um, Patrick's just said, there's, there's probably some value in tr maybe trying to simplify the report in future. Um, because as you say, there's an awful lot there and you, 
Yeah, you're, you're quite rightly reliant on me as the, the Chief Finance Officer to, to give that assurance. And, I, and hopefully I've done that. But they're, they're, um, I will try to look to improve the, uh, the um, conciseness of that report going forward because there is an awful lot of information in there. I was a little bit torn as to how we play this, but I felt it was important that you did see all the, um, the uh, answers to the questions, as indeed I shared that with you last year, um, Councillor Bones. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Darren Wells, please. Can I bring you in now? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. It, it was just to make clear that um, the purpose of that report is as Tony describes. But from, from members' perspective, all we are really seeking that you do is highlight if any of the responses uh, are contrary to the knowledge that you may have. So we're not we're not expecting members to go out and research and understand in detail uh, the questions and the responses, but it's just if anything strikes you to be different to your understanding of the council, its position and its operations. Thank you very much, Mr Wells. And in fact, the motion that we'll be considering actually is about that. It's about whether or not the report um, aligns with our own understanding. So that's what we will be voting for uh, shortly. Um, Councillor Barnes. It's a comment rather than a question, but there's a huge emphasis here on fraud, and uh, that's perfectly proper in terms of a regularity audit. Um, but given that we are actually drawing down our reserves at quite a rapid rate, um, I can see now why they raise, why the auditors raise the question of the distinction between statutory and non-statutory services. And page 121 brings out a, a going concern thing. And I think Patrick's question uh, to our Section 151 officer and our own focus uh, does need to be less on fraud, which I'm not suspicious of. I think Gary activities make damn sure that our controls environment is excellent. Um, clearly, though, when you are drawing down reserves at a rate of, uh, well, quite sharp now, 3 million, uh, 3.2 million this year, um, the question of which services you actually uh, keep going is going to become a crucial one uh, unless we can make adequate savings in other ways. So I think the statutory, non-statutory um, distinction may become relevant. County, as you know, had to draw up what they called, because they, they had the same problem of statutory, non-statutory is a pretty arbitrary distinction. What they drew up was what they thought was the minimal budget that county needed to run. I think we are getting perilously close to that point. Um, we're going to dip below 5 million reserves. It's in the MT TFP, and that is a critical figure. And I think, therefore, um, focusing on page 121 and the answers there is quite important for this committee. Would you like to comment on that? It's very important. We, we, this, we, we stay with the actual reports in front of us, though, rather than stray into wider um, issues. Yeah. Well, I don't need to really, Chair, to, to reiterate what I said earlier. It's not that we're, um, we're fundamentally against the recommendation itself. It's just that trying to split the figures between uh, discretionary and, and um, uh, strategy, what, you know, it will be difficult in some areas. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, a head of service, uh, is that a statutory cost or a, um, uh, or a discretionary cost? And th the answer is going to be both. Uh, and to what degree are they statutory and discretionary? And that's, that's my point about the, the limited value. It's not that we're, uh, we're not going to do it. We've agreed to, to uh, review this as part of the 23-24 budget process. Um, as Councillor Byrne says, I, I don't really have anything to add on the reserve situation. It's been well, it's well documented, been well reported many, many times now. And I 
I hope all the members are, are fully aware of this. There's not really much more of, a, of any value that I can add to that. But as I say, the recommendation is, is, is not disputed. It's, um, it's just that, that I just, it needs to be qualified a little bit, I think. And there's also, um, the subject comes up again in the next item on the agenda, actually. So it, it will, it, there, there, it is on the agenda um, later on. Uh, any further comments before we move to the motion? Okay, do I have a proposal? for the motion, and it is that the audit manager's opinion on the control environment, paragraph 37, be approved. Do I have a proposal for that motion, please? I do. Mr. Barnes, Councillor Barnes, and do I have a seconder, please? I do, Councillor Langdon. Right, so the sorry, motion... Yes, sir. Sorry, Chair, I think we've got the wrong recommendation there. Have we? Oh, sorry, sorry. I don't know. Sorry. Oh, sorry, Louise. Um, yeah. So, so just, oh, just this one concern the management response. I'm yes, so sorry. sorry. Can I apologise to the committee? Um, it's all about understanding, and I just proved that I didn't have it. So uh, can I now read the correct motion, which is, the members confirm, thank you very much uh, for that help, Louise. Um, the, the motion is, members confirm that the management responses in Appendix A are in line with their own understanding. Okay, so there's the motion. Do I have a proposal for that motion? Mr. Barnes, <laughs> Councillor Barnes, is coming to the rescue again, and Councillor Langdon, so the same people. All right, so there's the motion. Those in favour, please show. And those against, and those abstaining. Thank you very much. Pass with one abstention. Okay, now, it's been a long meeting, and so we come now to the one but last, the penultimate um, one, Treasury Management Update, and it's Tony Baden again. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, yeah, so this, this is the, I should stress first of all, um, well, well, members are asked to note the report, and this is the draft 21-22 outturn, and the reason it's draft is obviously because the, the numbers are, are still subject to audit, but um, there is nothing in these numbers that I expect to, uh, to change uh, at this point in time. Uh, so it's the, it's the final quarter update, um, and again, it's the, it's the usual standard format that we've been reporting in now for several, for several quarters, really. Um, and it's, the, it's a requirement of the uh, SIP for codes of, uh, Treasury Management Codes of Practice. Uh, it's a requirement of the Department of Leveling Up and Housing Communities Codes of Practice um, that we give members a, a regular update, and we do that on a quarterly basis. Um, so to go into the, the interesting bits of the report, if you like, um, the, I won't go through the whole thing in, in, in detail, but again, I'm more than happy to take questions as ever. Um, the points that I would like to make out to members, investment performance on our um, property funds with the CCLA and Hermes, uh, they've, ranged, they've returned uh, an income to us of between 3.4 and 3.6%, which, uh, which is quite pleasing. Uh, the capital financing requirement uh, has not changed significantly during 21-22. Um, this is again, this is because of the the, the pace of the uh, the uh, capital program. Uh, we are in a slightly overborrowed position for for quarter three, um, but that's all. Uh, um, sorry for uh, for quarter four, but that's probably disappeared by now. That we've already purchased new um, uh, new property in in, in April uh, in Buckhurst Place. And what I mean by uh, overborrowed is that um, we're not supposed to borrow more than uh, our capital financing requirement. Now, our capital financing requirement uh, is, put simply, it's how much the, uh, the council um, looks to fund capital expenditure from borrowing. Um, so we're not supposed to, uh, to go uh, overshoot that number. We did very slightly, but it's not, um, it's, it's not, uh, it's not uh, an issue for the council. Uh, it, the, the sort of control is there so that it stops um, councils borrowing in advance and maybe then getting a better yield on the market and it's not, not deemed to be, um, deemed to be a, 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 a right and proper thing to do with, uh, with public funding. Um, as I say, we don't do it. We, we did it because we took, out, we took advantage of, uh, of the very low interest rates in August and December, which enabled us to, to lock in long-term borrowing for... Um, for a 50-year period, and we locked in those interest rates at 1.64% and 1.78%. Um, but as I say, now, the, uh, now that we bought uh, Buckhurst Place back in April, the, um, uh, the overborrowed position would almost certainly have disappeared by now. Uh, as I say, it did used to be frowned upon. Uh, the revised SIPFA code, now SIPFA did revise the code of um, Treasury Management 
uh, back in and the Prudential Borrowing Code, they revised that back in December 2021. And interestingly enough, it takes the phrase away, borrowing in advance, or uh, in, advance of borrow, in advance borrowing, or, or whatever the, the official phrase one was. And they, they've actually taken that away now. And they, they, the, the focus is more about stopping councils borrowing to yield. Uh, and we had an interesting um, story about that earlier. So we don't, uh, we, we, that, that doesn't apply to us. It's not something we've ever entertained doing. Um, of more interest to members in, in, the, uh, in the appendices, uh, the net financing costs are 1.774% of our net revenue stream. So basically that's just saying that our borrowing costs eat up 1.74% of our income each year. Uh, we do expect that figure to increase, though, as the capital programme activity rank, ranks up um, and we purchase more, more properties and purchase more temporary accommodation units, for example. So that, that figure will increase. But it is all about um, affordability. Um, we will, of course, re review that situation when we come to do the medium-term financial plan again in the, in the summer and report that to uh, members in the autumn. Uh, the affordability and the net financing cost figures will then become quite relevant and significant for members of this committee to, uh, to understand. A uh, little bit about the property investment strategy and non-property in uh, investment strategy assets. Um, they perform quite well. Again, we've... Uh, we've um, Exceeded budget by about seventy-seven thousand um, pounds, and the the return on our on our um, on, on those investments are, uh, are about five percent for the non-property investment um, strategy assets, and uh, just over three percent for the property uh, assets pro purchased under the property investment strategy. And the reason for the difference between the two is because the non-property investment strategy assets are, are historical assets and have no loan debt outstanding against them. So they don't have the cost of borrowing driving it down, if you like. And just a little bit there about the economic outlook, which is, um, is increasingly difficult to, uh, to write these days. Uh, and actually, since I wrote this report, the interest rates um, rose again. Uh, the Bank of England rose, uh, increased them by a quarter of a percent. And, of course, the relevance of that, and I do try to keep the economic outlook relevant to the Council, the relevance of that, of course, is any changes in the interest rates then drives changes in the Public Works Loan Board's interest rates. So, uh, again, that brings me back also to my point about affordability, and we'll have to review that as part of the medium-term plan going forward. Um, less obvious, I suppose, the impact of energy costs increases to the Council. That will obviously have a direct impact on our budget, but it's, uh, the overall, uh, if you like, the, the cost of living crisis will, it could have an impact on the ability uh, of council taxpayers to pay council tax and businesses to pay um, business rates. And, of course, that will then hit the council if we have lower collection rates. We do monitor those collection rates as a matter of course during the financial year, and we report those to uh, in the monitoring report uh, to uh, Overview and Scrutiny Committee and Cabinet. So we do keep an eye on those um, collection rates. They, interestingly, didn't suffer too much during the um, pandemic and lockdown, which was encouraging, but I think we're in the a very different uh, ball game now and it, it, you know, we don't really know what the impact's going to be but it could be quite uh, a bit more severe this time uh, that's it chair there's, there's nothing really uh, else I want nothing else I want to add and as I say as ever I'm happy to try and take any questions thank you Gary uh, Councillor Mary Barnes yes thank you chairman um, there's no reference in here to the flat purchase of the land of the flat, flat trial is that because it doesn't come into any of the categories of the list, or can you just explain in the in the forthcoming year particularly how you will finance that? Is it coming out of borrowing, or is it part of your reserves, or how is that going to happen? Sorry, I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Barnes. Um, Black Friars was purchased, I mean, I'm not the best place to, to answer this in terms of the dates and the timings, but Black Friars was purchased by, uh, by uh, and funded by a grant from um, Homes England, and that was um, uh, you know, uh, two, well, several years ago now, two or three years ago now. So um, it wouldn't specifically appear in this report because it's not really directly relevant to, to the overall tre treasury management function, but... Um, it was relevant, it was, sorry, it was funded by, uh, largely by a grant from central government, or from Homes England. Councillor yeah. Barnes, But I understood some of that payment was going to be made by Rother. Uh, am I wrong in that? 
Sorry, Chair. I don't have the, uh, the precise details to hand, Councillor Barnes. I'm happy to, to respond back to you, but the, the majority of the costs uh, is funded by Homes England Grant, but I, I don't have the detail to hand. I'll have to get back to you on that. Any further comments? Um, Mr Palmer first, and I think then Councillor Barnes, and then Councillor Cordell. Questions for you, Tony. The first one is, in your training this afternoon, you pointed out that it was not a good idea to put too much, uh, too many eggs in one basket. Yet the vast majority of the cash you've got on call is with Lloyds. Something like 80% 80, 80 of it or more. Is that a good idea? Tony? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, well, there are several baskets there that we spread the, the money across. But I did also say um, this afternoon that so that is a snapshot in time of what the, the bank balance is. And there could be lots of, there are, almost certainly will be uh, lots of cash in there that doesn't actually belong to the council. So there will be um, the council tax presets, for example, that we have to pay to uh, East Sussex, the fire authority and the police. Similar with business rates as well, and there are it also includes government grants, um, uh, COVID grants that uh, haven't been distributed because they haven't been claimed. Basically, uh, now we can't invest those in, in anything that it's not our money really to invest that in. That wasn't my question, Tony. My, my question is: I accept that that's money you can't get an interest in, you can't invest anywhere. It's on a call account, but it's all with Lloyd's. And your concern was that if a bank goes bust, and I know Lloyd's may pop you one that's going to go bust, but I thought your training this afternoon pointed out it's best to have it in a number of accounts, e even if they're uh, a call account that you are not in expecting any return on. As I say, I, if I, took a, I could take a snapshot a week later, and that 50 million could be significantly less. That, that's the point I'm getting. So that, that it's in our general account because that's where we make payments from. I accept that, but it's all in one bank. We have one general account. We have one banker for for um. Yeah, we have. We just use Lloyd's Bank as a general account. Yes. Okay. I was only referring to your comment about not putting it with one bank. No. Yeah, that's, I appreciate that, um, Catherine. It's a fair comment, but um, well, as I say, we we do spread them over other other bank. Other banking institutions as well. Okay, my second question is. I'm sorry. No, please. Um, the second question, Tony, is: interest rates have gone up significantly. Uh, can we expect that at least some of these accounts, where you are putting them, notice accounts or the uh, Santander and others, should be paying you more than the measly amount they're paying you at the moment? I, I know that there, is, there are many instant access accounts at the moment that are paying over 1%, uh, and certainly notice accounts even more than that. Tony? No, it's a fair point. We, as I say, we review our, um, our cash flow situation on a daily basis. Uh, bear in mind this report was, the numbers bear, uh, relate to the 31st of March, so it's, you know, it's about nearly getting on to three months ago. Um, but yeah, you make a fair point, we do keep an eye. Uh, thank you for your point. Uh, any further questions? Councillor Barnes. Part, part question, part comment, Chairman. Um, yes, in some ways, I, I, I was thinking along the same lines as Patrick, and then thinking, well, a call account is rather different from uh, an account in which you're going to hold money for some time. I just wondered if treating them as identical and measuring your percentages is really the best way of presenting that. Um, the other thing uh, came out of what my wife was saying, and you and I, as chairman, are going to have to be a bit careful here. So I preface by saying I'm speaking as a member of the audit committee and not as a director of Rother District Council Housing. But I need to put on record that I am a director of Brother District Housing. Um, yes, can I just say we'll have to be very cautious. I, I, am, I am being very to use cautious. Not the information that we have as a consequence of uh, commercial confidentiality. I, yes. I'm not going to ask that sort of question. Um, but what my question really is, I think probably around the. 
the sums on which I would congratulate Tony on borrowing in advance because we have got extraordinarily favourable rates and I think we should recognise uh, his prudence and foresight, frankly. Um, I'm just wondering if some of that money, because um, I think there was a confusion in Tony's mind between the purchase of the Blackfriars site, which presumably goes back 40-odd years, the money for the road, which came from Holmes, England, but then there will be a building contract, which I suspect may have fallen within the calendar year. And I'm wondering if that's covered in the various headings. Um, or, but it is something which this committee is going to have to think about going forward uh, because the relationship with the housing company does not fit easily with the categories in this report. Can I just say from the chair, just to let the committee know, if you don't know already, there will be a specific report dealing with Alliance, uh, sorry, rather uh, District Council Homes coming to the next meeting of this committee. So it may be that some of these issues could be left until that meeting. Okay. Thank you. Alex. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, first of all, apologies if I've understood um, Councillor Mary Barnes's question. I'll, I'll pick it up with you outside the meeting, uh, Councillor, and just make sure I've got the, uh, got the question right in my mind. Uh, and there was another point. Uh, yes, sorry. So the, the, the um, financial, the accounts that we're reporting here are just the council's accounts. They don't pick up any, any um, uh, accounts associated with the, the housing company. Councillor Cotel. I'm interested in knowing um, what the three various headings stand for in Appendix B and the current borrowing portfolio. We've got um, over 50% of the £27 million pounds borrowed um, and the three headings are various. Um, is, the, is, for example, one bit of it um, uh, properties that have been purchased for the homeless that we're doing up and you don't want to list all the individual properties? Is it other things? Sorry, Chair, I, could, I don't quite follow where, where on the report you're referring to, Councillor. Current Council. borrowing portfolio. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, the, um, it's on in Appendix B. You start with capital financing requirement, then move down to current borrowing portfolio. Um, and um, you've got the you list Terminus Road, Beeching Road, Glover's House, uh, and you've got a whole lot of various. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, uh, you've made a good point, actually, Councillor Cortell. That current borrowing portfolio was um, its mainly around the, uh, the property. It tried to list out the property investment, uh, properties purchased under the property investment strategy, but it covers all of our um, capital borrowing. Uh, there, there wasn't... What, I, what we don't really do, uh, but when we took out the original loans, I mean, if you look, for example, um, uh, say, Barnhorn Road or Glover's House, they were purchased, we took out borrowing for those uh, properties for that particular specific reason. But when we locked in the, uh, take for example, when we took out the later borrowing, at one point, you know, the, the cheap borrowing at 1.78 and 1.65%, that was purely around just trying to lock in borrowing to fund capital expenditure. It wasn't actually earmarked against any particular asset purchase. Um, yeah, if we, if we listed all our uh, capital assets down there, I mean, we can, you know, it will be in this statement of accounts as well as reported in the statement of accounts which assets are funded from borrowing and or, or which projects are funded from borrowing and which are funded from grants and so forth. So it is in there. Uh, that that table is really for, um, you know, to try and make it a bit more concise rather than a, rather than a lengthy table. But as I say, we don't actually take out loan, um, fresh borrowing, uh, specifically in market against particular projects. We just we borrow it out when we see that there's a need. Thank you, that's clear. Thank you very much, thank you for the question and the answer. Any further comments on this report, please? There are none. So uh, our job here is to um, resolve that uh, we, we, uh, the report is noted. So uh, 
the report should have noted, those in favour of that, please show. Those against, those abstaining. We understand why you're abstaining. Okay, thank you very much. That's also passed. Um, and finally, we come to the work programme, which is simply for noting. Okay, so there's nothing, I think, more to be said about that. So just noting that. And at this point, we've come to the end of the meeting. Um, can I take this opportunity of thanking uh, the officers for the extreme thoroughness of all the reports we've considered this evening? Uh, yes, can, can, can I say that? But I couldn't see where uh, we're going to look at risk. It, uh, is it September we've got, and that, that's where you're proposing to bring back um, your answer to Patrick's question? Uh, no, no, do, you, do you know the answer to that? Yes, um, that will update the new risk register and the work we've been doing there and the risk appetite that I, that I mentioned and it would all be coming through on that September report. Happy with that? Yeah. All right. So, so just to say again that I'm very, very grateful to the officers for extremely thorough um, reports, and very, very helpful. I'd like to thank members of the committee. I know that many of you were at a meeting this afternoon, and I think you've done a splendid job of wilting to the absolute minimal extent, and also I think you've done very well in having a debate that produced a great deal more light than it did heat. If it had produced heat, we would have melted so it's a very, very good job that uh, we were able to have the kind of debate that we had. Uh, lots of very um, pertinent and precise points being uh, raised. I think the committee did itself proud this evening. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Um, and the, do we have the date of the next meeting? July. 27th of July is the next meeting. And look forward to seeing you then. Um, and the meeting is closed at 8.21 p.m. Thank you very much, Edward.